because I would typically have a spray with shellac on it, but I didn't get time to do it because I just put this one together last night. <laughs> so, but anyway, a lot of people would probably be asking, well, what, do you, what do you do? What do you, you know, what's your style of ride and all that kind of stuff. I kind of follow the, the California, very traditional Vaquero style of riding. It's come to be known as the Tom Dorrance or Ray Hunt style of riding. They were kind of the, the masters and the mentors of this particular style of horsemanship. Typically, we I prefer to start a horse, a young horse, a two or three year old, in a snaffle bit. This particular snaffle bit is called a, a ball and hinge snaffle, but it's a single jointed mouthpiece. You could also have a, a ring snaffle or an egg butt or a D ring snaffle, and that refers to the style of, of ring that's attached to the mouthpiece. I like a brow band head stall with double adjusted buckles and then a McCarty rein setup. The deal with the McCarty is I have a rein over top of their neck, but then I have a lead rope as well. So if I get off my horse or whatever, I can still be attached to my horse. I would typically put the lead rope through, through my belt. So when I would step off my horse, I still have both hands free, but I'm still connected to the there's quite a, a list of <clears throat> movements or requirements on the horse's part to go from this to graduate, we call it, from this to this. Now very historically, the Californians, because they didn't have steel snaffle bits in the 17 and 1800s, they would start their young horses in a hackamore just like this. They'd end up riding those horses till they're they're probably four or five years old in a hackmore. And then they go to what I'll get to here after a bit. But nowadays, because we have a snaffle bit, we figured this is the most mild piece of equipment that you could use. Quite honestly, it's the most harsh in the horse's mouth because it literally sits on the gums <coughs> of the horse's mouth, whereas a bridle bit, which I'll show you in a minute, actually sits on the horse's tongue. So a little bit, a little bit different, but anyway, this is what we start the young horses in. I'd ride them in a perfect world. I'd start in the spring of their two-year-old year and ride them probably till the fall of their three-year-old year in this. And like I say, there's a laundry list of requirements that I'd want those horses to be able to do. And then they would graduate into the hackamore. Now, because these are both hair ropes, you'd never tie your horse up with this. You'd end up hobble breaking your horses. So you could step off and hobble them, tying the two front legs together, and then go do a doctor, your, your cattle, open a gate, whatever it might be, and then come back and get your horse. How much space do you have when you hobble a horse? How much length the rope do you have between the front legs? Well, it kind of varies, Joe, depending upon your hobbles, of course, but most of the time there's only anywhere from, from four to eight inches apart, the front legs. And for me, hobble breaking a horse is if I, if I had a horse and hobble broke it, I'd want to put the hobbles on and come back in the morning, so to speak, a long period of time, and have the horse still standing there, not 100 yards over there after grazing with the hobbles on. Because there's places I go and places where I've been, there isn't a fence or a tree for hundreds of miles. And if the horse grazes with the hobbles on, he might be 20 or 30 miles away by the time I come back. <laughs> well, what the heck is the point? You should have just turned him loose. It would have been safer for him. So when I hobble one, I want him to stand right there and have a little tiny ring around him where their hind legs walk around the front legs like this or the other way. And where the front feet stand, the grass is all mashed down and about a ring about that much. Just I don't want him going anywhere. So. But most often the front legs are six to four to six inches, eight inches apart. So, but anyway, so you ride until the fall of their three-year-old year in this, then you go to the hackamore. There's no additional movements introduced or anything like that when you're into this stage. This is still a two-handed piece of equipment as well as this. Um, but then you get to where you ride them with your hands coming closer and closer together over time with this with this uh, hackamore. 
the fall of their three-year-old year, probably till the fall of their four-year-old year, you'd ride them in this. And then you'd, you'd take this off and they would graduate into what we call the two-ring, which is a miniature version of what I just took off of it. This is still a, a, still a hackamore, it's just what we call a pencil hackamore, just because of the diameter. And then we put a California style bridle bit over the top of that. So you have plus two sets of reins in your hand. You have the hackamore rein and then the bridle rein. So they look kind of like this. On a two rein outfit, there's still lead rope on your McCarty. So you still have a way to lead your horse if you had to get off or whatever. So you put the pencil hackamore on first and then the bridle bit over the top. And then over the course of time, at first, you'd be picking up on the hackamore rein and the bridle reins would be quite, quite slack because he's used to being operated off the hackamore. Then over the course of time, the reins would get more even and they both take hold at the same time. And then of course, over time further yet, you would end up just dropping the hackamore rein over his neck and you'd operate him totally off the bridle rein. Then from the fall of their four-year-old year, spring of their five-year-old year, you'd put them in the two rein and you might ride them for two years or so in the two rein because quite honestly, this is a pretty stylish piece of equipment and there's nothing wrong with looking good. So, uh, you know, you'd ride them in this probably for about two years. And then eventually, you would take the, the miniature hackmore off and you put on what's called a Bosalita. This is a, this is a miniature hackmore, but there's no no McCarty tied to it. So we refer to it as a Bosalita. This is actually totally ornamentation. It serves no physical purpose, but it is to honor the broad horse, the fact that he's graduated to this stage of his education. Okay? Then, because you don't lead your horse with the bridle reins, contrary to what you see in the movies, you'd have a you'd have a get down rope, and you could tie this this little thin rope around around his neck, and then you'd be able to lead him with that. <clears throat> a lot of guys sometimes tie their their get down rope to the bottom of their bosalita, which is a personal preference thing. I don't do it that way, but a lot of guys do, and that's accepted. So. But the big thing that I really wanted to talk about was, was the bridle bit. This is an upper pallet bit. A lot of people would call it a leverage type bit because when you take hold of it, it moves that mouthpiece in the horse's head. There's a, several different pieces to a bridle bit. You have the, the port, the bars of the bit, the cricket, which is that little roller in there, and then the cheek piece. Historically, the cheek piece identified where the vaquero came from. Now, this was very tr traditional in California, and actually, that was where the first cowboys ever were. There was, there was cowboys gathering and working cattle in California 100 years before there was anybody in Texas at all. And the reason that the Texas cowboys are sometimes referred to as cowpokes <coughs> is because historically to get to Texas, they came in covered wagons and the young boys would walk along behind the oxen, the yoke of oxen and poke them in the butt with a stick to get them to go and they were the cow pokes. <laughs> That's where it came from. But that was a hundred years after they were riding and roping in California. The reason that you don't hear about that is because in California the first first cowboys were actually either Mexicans or Indians. They weren't Anglo-Americans. Um, <clears throat> this is, an, is another bride of his, but it's what we call a half-breed. You can basically see that it's literally half 
of the volume in the horse's mouth is this what we call a spade bit. I can sort out all this. Okay. The reason that there are two different mouthpieces like that, and these are definitely classically, historically, the two that were most used. Now there's a million different kinds of mouthpieces, but historically this was referred to as a Spanish spade. Okay? This would be a half breed. The reason that they came to a half breed is because the vaqueros or the Spaniards that conquered Alta California, they ended up having such vast herds of cattle and whatnot that they couldn't take care of them. So the Indians that they enslaved when they conquered California, the more trusted of those slaves were given the job of being a cowboy or a vaquero, a buckaroo, and they were allowed to actually ride horses. But the Spaniards didn't think that anybody could make a horse as good as they could, so they didn't want to give them a full bridle. So they gave them a half-breed. The reason it's called a half-breed is because it's literally half of what this is. There's no copper braces and there's no port. There's just the bar of the mouthpiece, the cricket, and then that little piece of metal there, the, 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 the tower or cathedral over the cricket. The reason they were half-breeds is because most of those guys were actually half Mexican and half Indian because some of the Mexicans married Indian wives and their offspring were half-bloods, consequently a half-breed. Well, over time they figured out that a lot of those half-breeds were making just as good of horses as the real Spaniards, so then they started letting them use full spades. Okay. Now, a lot of different variations and personal preferences go along with bridle bits like this or even this. A bridle bit like this, <clears throat> physically because it's less in their mouth, you could actually start using with your horse sooner than this. It takes a little bit longer for the horse to learn how to pack this. Because of the angle of this mouthpiece, that horse will naturally assume about an 86 or 87 degree head position on the end of his neck. When you pick up on the reins, it causes that horse's head to go 90 degrees vertically. We call that being on the bit or bridled up. Okay. The different cheek pieces identified where those vaqueros came from because the, the missions along the California uh, El Camino Royal, which was the road that went from Old Mexico up through California, there was a lot of missions on that road there. All those Santa towns that exist in California now, those are all missions at one point. Santa Cruz, where I live. Yeah. What's that? Santa Cruz, where I live. There you it's go. A beautiful mission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So this particular cheek piece is a Santa Paula cheek piece. Santa Paula, California, Santa Paula Mission. This is the most classic and actually the largest of all the missions of Santa Barbara cheek piece. It goes back, this style of cheek piece goes back clear to the Moors of North Africa who went and conquered the Spaniards in Spain and then those Spaniards came and conquered Central America and then on up the coast into California. Santa Barbara at one time was the biggest mission of all of them, and it's the most common and probably the most <coughs> traditional cheek piece of all the California cheek pieces. But historically, there was only 11 cheek pieces. And you could tell a vaquero by his, by his bridle bit where he worked at, or where he came from. Now there's 10,000 different cheek pieces, but, but real traditional historical ones, they'd all be named after the California mission. So. But by the time the horse is six, well, seven and a half or eight years old, we typically refer to them as being straight up in the bridle. We call it the fourth and final stage of the horse's education, but it's really not because he should be getting better all the time, even when you're riding him in the bridle. When you put him in the two rein, when there's that miniature Bozelle in here, we call that the two rein. That's the first stage where you ride the horse in one hand. But we use the two rein because we have the advantage of if the work gets real fast or the work gets really intricate, we can go back to using two reins on the McCarty and just the reins in one hand. 
and that horse is more familiar with that because of what we did in the snaffle this year and then in the hackmore. But then over the course of time, we drop the hackmore out and then we just ride with the reins on our fist. Like what you see in the movies as far as holding the reins. <laughs> but in the movies, it, it's a little bit awkward. My wife hates to watch Western movies because of the horsemanship. <laughs> I tell her, look, they didn't, they didn't care about horsemanship in those days. It's not about horsemanship, it's about the good and bad guys, you know? <laughs> but when the, if this is on the horse's head and the, and the rider takes the reins and goes like this, you would have think or associate with that with taking a right turn. Next time you watch a Western movie, see if the horse actually turns his head like this and goes over there, or if he turns his head like this and falls over there. Because of the way this mouthpiece and bridle work, a supporting rein, which would be the left rein on a right turn, should cause that horse's head to do this, and then, be, then, then basically put his chin down and in, recall. But if the horse is not educated to that kind of riding or that kind of cue, when you pull on the left rein on a bridle bit, the bit's going to do this and that. Well, to get away from that pressure, that horse is going to do this. He's going to turn his ear or his jaw up to the sun, and he's going to fall in the opposite direction. So just a little trivia. Next time you see a Western movie, just take a note of that. But, so, but anyway, that's that's kind of what the whole premise of this little wooden block started for the program today. Not that the block started this stuff, but um, I was just going to come talk about this, and then I thought, well, that was kind of foolish because nobody would know what the hell I was talking about anyway. But, so, but. Uh, by the time the horse is eight years old, in a perfect world, you'd like to see him straight up in the bridle. Uh, I don't have that many bridle horses because I, I don't own that many. And I don't keep outside horses long enough. And in the perfect world, like I say, you'd have to be riding those horses five or six days a week. You know, and that doesn't happen either, unfortunately. So, but. That's kind of the gear that I use, kind of where it comes from, and, and uh, a little bit of history behind it. The reason that they're so silver and ornate and, and that kind of thing is because that honors the horse, the horse's education, whatever, even on a snap a bit. There's lots of silver a lot of times, which is extremely contradictory to anybody that's really wrought in Texas tradition. In Texas, it's all very flat, colored stuff, earth tones, leather strap goods, no silver, no rawhide, nothing like that. Because historically, nobody in Texas wanted anyone around them to think that a Spaniard might have influenced them in any way. They got little tiny horns on their saddles, great big swells on their saddles. A Mexican has a great big horn. No swells, lots of silver, ornate kind of stuff. Texan does not have any of that. And you're not gonna you're not gonna read that in any American history book at all, because it's it was a sign of prejudice. Prejudiceism. That's true. But that's that's the truth. And you can go to any Texan and ask them, and they, they'll tell you that. Now I'm not saying they don't ride with big saddle horns and you know. It's raw hide and silver in Texas now, because a lot of guys do actually, and they're good hands without a doubt. But historically, that was the reason behind the Texas cowboy versus the California Buckaroo Nevada cowboy in the West, is because they did not want to be confused or conflicted with being being prejudiced. So, but anyway. Is there any questions? We're talking about bits. I was thinking about the uh, what you call the, uh, the the bit you had before, which is uh, the snapple bit. The snapple bit. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the kind of bit that uh, goes straight across, which has a <laughs> in the middle of it. 
Which is just a straight bit, a little what I call straight bit. Yeah. Uh, is it better or worse or better? <coughs> it's all a matter of opinion, quite honestly, Joe. The bit that you're probably talking about historically for where I come from on was probably a workhorse bit for a team. Yeah. Yeah. I would never use that kind of bit on a satellite. You know. And a lot of people think that <clears throat> not so much in the Western world but in the English world, that this mouthpiece is just too small in diameter. And it can be rough on the horse's mouth. So they want to put a great big fat rubber one in the horse's mouth, thinking that it's gentler on the horse's mouth. My, my analogy is take your forearm and put it in your mouth or take a wooden pencil and put it in your mouth. And which one is more comfortable to you? The wooden pencil probably would be more comfortable because you can actually get your mouth around it. Whereas big fat rubber thing, the horses can't get their mouth around so it's totally uncomfortable. But <coughs> As far as as far as bits go, and like you guys experience, you know, the ways of training horses and all that kind of stuff, there's a million different ways to do it. Some are good, some are bad, and everybody's got their opinion about both. But for me, I kind of adhere to to this style of horsemanship and this style of riding because of who and what I learned and where I come from. You know, so I'm not saying any of those other ones are that particularly bad or anything like that. It's just not what I do. So, those? You said where you come from. Why don't you tell us where you came from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I came from Montana. Uh, but the guys that I grew up around, <laughs> they didn't have any notion of this style of horsemanship. And not because this style of horsemanship wasn't around then, it just wasn't well known. But they were all really good hands, very capable, good cowboys. And they were very caring for their horses. And by that I mean, they not, yeah, they fed them and they drained them and they took care of their feet and they wormed them and they gave them vaccinations and all kind of stuff. But they were very conscientious of how the horse emotionally felt when they were riding. <clears throat> Because I'm sure some of you have seen horses that might have been being ridden, that had their ears laid back, their teeth were gnashing away, grinding away, their tail was ringing, all that kind of stuff. And then there's other horses that were walking right alongside that same horse. Ears were forward, bright eyed, mouth was quiet, tail was quiet, and they were both walking down the same street. Now what's the difference? The guy riding the one that's having a problem wasn't giving him a good feel physically. And the feel that I'm talking about is like when your significant other walks into a room and you have your back turned to them, you can still feel them there without turning around and looking at them and without them speaking to you. That's a feel. It comes from in here or in here. I know that's a hair roll because I can feel it. That's not the feel I'm talking about. The feel I'm talking about is what's in here. The British of seat. The what? A seat. Yeah. Having a seat or not having Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, so that's kind of where I came from. I never got hooked onto this style of horsemanship until I was 19 years old. And I, I drove a lot of horses by then. You know. Um, but. And I shudder to think back of what I did on horses when I was a kid. Thinking, man, I, I would hang myself if I did that kind of stuff today. But I didn't know any different. You know, I mean, so that's how it worked. So the snap of it is gentler? It really depends on the guy's hands that's running and joint. Quite frankly, the speed, and that's what people think. Quite honestly, that's a very common thing. But this mouthpiece sits on the horse's tongue like that, and that right there makes contact with the horse's upper palate. Well, because of the physically how it operates, that causes that horse to do this, which it actually is very easy for the horse to be able to do. 
because that sits on the horse's tongue. When the, when the bit rotates like that, the, the port of the bit ends up going up against the horse's palate. And that's what causes the horse to achieve that particular angle of his head. This, however, sits right on the horse's gums, physically. So when you pull on this one, it's, it's putting pressure on the left side of his gum. When you pull on the right rein, it's putting pressure on the right side of his gum. Now it can be a very gentle piece of equipment and that's why we use it on the really young green horses. But in the wrong hands, it could be twice as detrimental as this. Because when you pull on this, it's only one thing that moves, <coughs> the entire thing. When you pull on this, it's only this little piece right here that moves the bar of this particular cheek or mouthpiece, and that's what goes down on the horse's gums. So it really depends on who's running the reins. That's like everybody tells you, all oh, the computer, all oh, the computer, they're so great. No, they're not. Because if you don't know how the hell to run it, it ain't gonna do you a bit of good. Because somebody's gotta push the button. Well, if the guy pushing the button doesn't know, doesn't make a dang bit of difference what kind of computer you got. So it's the operator, quite frankly. So we always had a horse or two when I was growing up and I never saw anything with a straight bit. Well, just because it was more common for work horses than a saddle horse, yeah. Yeah. So when I was a kid there was a lot of bits hanging in my grandfather's barn. They were they were straight, big and heck they were three quarters of an inch in diameter, the mouthpiece, on eight inch rings, they were workhorse bits. I mean, that's, you know. And if you wanted to ride one, that's what you rode it with, because that's what was there. Yeah. I, nowadays, it, I wouldn't do that now, I'd, I'd use this. And quite frankly, they say, you know, putting this on a young horse, and then by the time he's a certain age, he's gotta be in a stiff bit. I ride a lot of 10 and 12 year old horses in this right here because it's the amount of education they have, not strictly due to their age. So. And the education I'm talking about is how you can maneuver it, being able to do different things and that kind of stuff. So. Anybody else? Would that be the kind of bed for jumping? I would definitely use this for jumping, yeah. I wouldn't use a McCarty setup like this, though, just because there's too much stuff here to get hung up. But I would definitely use a snap bit like this, yeah. I wouldn't jump one in the bridle bit because there's too much chance they could bump, bump that cheek on, on a rail going over. <coughs> so I, even if a horse was educated enough to be in this, I'd put him in this to jump him. So, Phyllis? Uh, um, I Most of the time I, I demonstrate different maneuvers on the horse that I am personally riding and then watch them attempt to do the same maneuvers on their horses. If it ends up looking like it's going to get a little dicey for the horse and or for the person, I might intervene and take hold of their horse and do a little something with it, but then I'm going to give their horse back to them so they can, they can work at getting better themselves in addition to being able to get their horse fit. So, and sometimes that would be what we refer to as groundwork, getting the horse prepared on the end of the halter rope before you went on to ride. Then when it comes to the riding part, I'm demonstrating on the horse that I'm sitting on and then watching them attempt to do the same thing. When you, when you go to a clinic, do you take your horse with you? Yes, yep, yeah. It, it would be extremely difficult for me to do a clinic without having a horse to demonstrate with. Okay, I just wondered if you one of their horses with your own. Well, like when I fly to New Hampshire, I use that one of their horses just for the convenience, of course. But uh, like Missy and I are actually going down to Australia in January to participate in a clinic called the Legacy of Legends, and we'll use demonstration horses. And there'll be horses from down there. Just want to take horses, of course. That's going to be a little bit different.
because they're not our horses. Like when we did the demonstration at the World Cup there in Omaha this last April, we had our own horses because we just brought them home. So it was pretty easy to do that kind of a demo because they were our horses. I'm not sure how it's going to pan out down there, but we'll see. How long will you be there? I'll be there for three weeks, actually. Missy's only coming from, she's coming from Florida, though. So she'll come and we'll, we'll uh, we leave LA the 28th of December, and Missy will be home by the 7th of January. But she'll actually be back in Florida. She won't be coming home. So what is Missy doing now? She's, we're both doing a joint demonstration about how this style of horsemanship applies to the dressage world. To the English world, basically. So that's the unique thing about this style of horsemanship is that if you get them what we could refer to as started, historically you would call it being being broke, but we call it starting young horses now. You could go to any particular discipline you wanted, and the horse could be successful. So, all right, better wrap it up. Okay. Thank you, Kip. Okay, uh, just a reminder that we're going to meet at the cemetery after the uh, meeting to put up the flag. Do the creed. Promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. God, help, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. Make all your friends feel that there's something in them. That they look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true. To think only the best, to work only for the best, and to expect only the best. To be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. To forget the mistakes of the past and press on to the greater achievements of the future. To wear a cheerful countenance at all times and give every living creature you need to smile. To give you so much time to improve yourself she has no time to criticize others. Be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to be in the presence of trouble. Would you hey, just a minute? I'm sure to read through that totally uneducated attempt at convincing. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>